Luke chapter 15, starting at verse 25 is where we're going to pick up today. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. And when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Verse 28, the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and I never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And I want to take a few moments today, and I want to use uh, that scripture as uh, the premise of what I want to talk about. I want to talk about from this thought, lost and found, lost and found, as we are in our fourth part of this collection on Friend of Sinners. And would you pray with me today? We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to do what I can't do. Lord, we thank you so much that you're moving. We thank you, God, for what you're doing in our church right here at the iTech location, also there at JDD. I pray that today, Lord, on this Palm Sunday, that you would speak to people, that we would encounter the friend of sinners for ourselves. We love you in this place. We praise you in this place. We worship one name, the name of Jesus. We honor you. And if you believe it, all of God's people said, Amen. come on, all of God's people said, Amen. come on, 10 a.m., make some noise. <laughs> JDD, make some noise. <laughs> Uh, a couple of years ago, I, um, I got a chance to uh, take my wife on a little anniversary celebration. And living here in Miami, it gives you lots of opportunities to take fun and most of the time affordable vacations. And on, on this occasion, we decided to go on a, uh, a cruise together. I don't know if you've ever been on a cruise, but um, my wife and I, we, we've done a lot of cruises in our day. And uh, I remember we were having a good time. And you know, when you go on a cruise, like there's two things you do. You eat and you sleep. Amen. Oh, eat, sleep, and eat some more, you know? Um, th that late night pizza place just destroys me. I, I don't know, but somehow at two in the morning, I find myself just down there eating all you can eat pizza. And I, I leave the cruise always asking uh, God to forgive me for my sins of gluttony. But um, I remember it was one day that uh, Don Shree was taking like a nap and I heard like over the loudspeaker that you could go and uh, tour uh, the captain's quarters. I thought to myself, this is, uh, this is right up my alley. I would love to tour the captain's quarters. And so uh, Don Shrew was asleep, but I, I left her uh, in her slumber. And I, uh, I went into the captain's quarters, and I'll never forget it. I'm you know, meeting the captain, shaking his hand. What's up? It's your boy Rich. And we're just we're, we're, we're talking it up, and, and we're, we're seeing everything. And then he, he, I remember he, he, like, he takes us over to where you know, the steering wheel is. And uh, I don't know if you're like me, but like, you know, I, I see this steering wheel and like, I begin to salivate. Um, it wasn't pizza, but it was just as, it was just as attractive. I said, I said, Captain, you know, can I put my hands on the steering wheel? And he said, you know what? <clears throat> I'm not really supposed to do this, but I like you. And he goes, go for it. And so I remember I, I put my hands on the steering wheel. I looked at him, I said, I'm the captain now. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say, I didn't say that. <laughs> but I, I was there in uh, the captain's quarters with, with my hands on the steering wheel. And for a moment, uh, I felt like I was the captain of this massive cruise ship. Yet anybody who has a logical brain, anybody who's, who's, who's thinking in a practical sense, would say, Rich, just because you put your hands on the captain's steering wheel does not make you the captain. How crazy would it be for me to go, you know what? <laughs> I'm the captain of this ship. For two and a half seconds, my hands were on the wheel. That makes me captain. No, no, no. Just because I put on a stethoscope doesn't make me a doctor. Just because you, you stand in a garage, it doesn't make you a car. <laughs> Just because you come to church doesn't make you a Christian. I think sometimes we, we, we will do things and, and we'll, we'll practice something for a moment and in that moment we think that we are that thing. And 
Uh, we've been talking for the last couple of weeks of this idea that our God has a nickname, and his nickname is, is the friend of sinners. And ultimately, we, we kicked off this collection uh, talking about the fact that, that Jesus came for everyone. He came to bring those of us that deserve the back of the line, which is all of us, and he actually came as our fast pass to bring us to the front of the line. And, and Don Shree really begin to open up this idea that there's this missed message in the church that many times people, they, they view the gospel as this behavior modification message. They, they think it's this whole like bad and good message, but really it's so much deeper than that. It's the fact that you have to admit, all of us have to admit that without Jesus, we are lost. Without Jesus, we are the sinners. The other day I was, I was doing this interview and this person, as I went on to the show, they said, Rich is going to teach us that we are the friend of sinners because he is the friend to sinners. And they started their question. I said, I got I to gotta stop you right there because this book is not about me. <laughs> and this message is not about me being the friend of sinners. Th this message is, is that I have a friend and his name is Jesus. And I am the sinner, but I met one who came and befriended me. And last week we talked about how we, how we can underestimate this message over and over and over again. And now here we are today, and I wanna to talk to you about this idea that Jesus came for a relationship. He did not come to, to institute religion. He came to establish relationship with you. He did not come for a Sunday morning experience. He didn't come to bring you into the captain quarters for a moment so you could put your hand on the steering wheel and say, wow, I've accomplished all I've accomplished. Uh, been called to accomplish. No, 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 he's actually come to do life with you. He's actually come to make your life matter, not just on Sunday, but Monday matters. You can tackle Tuesday. Wednesday, you can actually still walk with the Holy Spirit. Thursday, you can still be thinking about him. Friday, you can be hanging with him. Saturday, it's still you and Jesus. It, it's every day he's, he's come for a relationship with you. And I wanted to draw your attention today, especially on this week, Palm Sunday, because I think if you're going to go to Voo Church, you're going to have to understand that we as a church, that we have this major priority and we have this major determination that we as a church, that we would step out into the night, that's our motto, that we'd step out into the world and we would be a bridge from the church to the world, that we too would be here for relationship, that we too would not be here to offer programs, but we'd actually be here to offer our hand in relationship with God. I think many times, if I can just be honest with you, when you do that, you can step into the night, but as you step into the night, how many know things can start to get gray? Yeah. Try to follow some of the metaphors today. When you're pulling people out of fire, you can oftentimes smell like smoke. Yeah. Uh, but I want our church to smell like smoke. Yeah. Uh, there's a reason why we came to Little Haiti. There's a reason why we have positioned ourselves in some challenging areas because we actually want to be a church that infiltrates and engages. I want us to have a church that you probably shouldn't leave your purse on, on the chair that you're sitting on and walk away because not everybody here is saved, okay? <laughs> I want us to have a church that there's enough people that are coming that are so lost and so far from God, yet somehow because you are a person of relationship and because you connect before you correct, because you offer grace before you offer truth, that people would feel welcome. And so on this Palm Sunday, I guess what I'm trying to say to you, those of you that are maybe new to this community or a part of this community, you're going to have to get comfortable with realizing that everything is always black and white. <laughs> but many times you got to step into the gray area a little bit. And many things that we're dealing with are not problems to solve, but rather they're tensions to manage. And what you have to be willing as a follower of Jesus at times is you have to be willing, like Jesus, to be criticized for the very same things he was criticized for. And so because Jesus did not just come for a Sunday sermon with a quick conversion, but rather he came to walk and do life with people, and he actually understood that sanctification was a process. That's why he had a guy in his camp, his name was Judas, and after three years of watching Jesus do all sorts of radical miracles, miracles that I've never witnessed with my own eyes, but even watching Jesus feed 5,000 people, and even watching Jesus actually do incredible things like turn water to wine, and healing blinded eyes, and healing deaf ears, even in witnessing all of those things, he still, after three years, betrayed Jesus. 
But Jesus was okay with that tension. He was okay with that process. He was okay with walking with people and he was okay with that gray area. So I think if you like black and white, you won't like Vu. But if you're okay to get into the mess and if you're okay to stand up in some moments where people will probably criticize you and people will probably wonder about your tactics and about your method, I think you will love Vu. Because at VU, what we've decided to do is we've decided to marry our mission and date our methods. Meaning our methods come and go, but we have one mission, which is to see the broken brought home, which is to see the dead come back to life, which is to see the lost found. Come on, somebody, make a little bit of noise. Luke 15, I'm trying to kind of give you a reason as we go to this text today why it matters on this weekend. It's because Jesus had been doing ministry for a little bit of time now. Vu Church has been doing ministry for a little bit of time now. And everywhere Jesus went, people were criticizing him. I mean, come on, he was doing some radical stuff. Like sometimes we read it and you grew up in Sunday school and so you don't realize how radical the things are that he was doing. But like he was hanging out with like criminals, like doing, like doing dinners with criminals He's hanging out in John chapter four with this Samaritan woman. I mean, desperate housewives of Samaria. That's who he's hanging out with. I don't know where his accountability partners are. He's all alone at a well. It's a scandalous story. Like, <laughs> Jesus just hanging. Just, I'm just teaching her. Whoa, bro, like bring a buddy, you know? And so he's being criticized left and right. What is this rabbi? What is this man of God? What is he doing? You and I, for the last three weeks, we have been witnessing that he, he came for a relationship. He came that people might admit, I am lost. I don't just come on Sunday. No, I, I'm lost. I need a savior. And he came for this relationship. But many times as he was criticized, he would never defend himself. I think oftentimes when people criticize us or say things about it, I don't think you have to go online. I don't think you actually have to write a blog. I don't think you actually have to answer every email. You don't actually have to debate everybody in the barber shop that makes fun of you for going to Voo Church. It's okay to take on the Jesus model and just shh. <laughs> but in Luke 15, theologians would say that this chapter was Jesus' defense to his ministry. So when you read Luke 15, it's not meant to be really read in isolated stories, but rather you're to see the totality of you're to see the bigger picture, the bird's eye view of what's taking place in the life of Jesus. That Jesus has been doing ministry. He's been at Ultra Fest pulling people out, praise God. <laughs> and now, finally, he's going to give reason as to why he does what he does. And what I believe is this, is I believe that Jesus' defense should be our defense. I believe Jesus' is why should be our why. The Bible says in Luke 15, I don't have time to read all the text to you. You're gonna have to go home. I dare you to go home this week and read this. If you'll actually start reading your Bible, it will be that much more powerful in your life. The power is not the words on the pages. The power is when the words get into your heart, okay? No. So Luke 15, the Bible says that on that day as he begins to teach, he has two crowds of people in front of him. On one side, he has... The criminals, he's got the, the tax collectors, prostitutes, he, he's got the, the low lowlifes, if you will. He's got the immoral group of people that are, that are literally running from God. On the other side, he's got this group of people that are the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious right, okay? So he's got both camps. I think it's important that you see both camps because how many of you know that we've never lived in a more polarizing time ever in America, that's not me taking a jab at anybody. That's just the reality of the world that we live in. We live in a time that if you and I disagree with each other, somehow we think that means we can disrespect each other. We live in a world that if I don't agree with you, that means I'm not gonna accept you. And so we find more things to be divided on rather than trying to find some things that we can be united in. And I think Jesus came to bring people together. So there he's teaching one day and he's got the Democrats and the Republicans. He's got the good and the bad. He's got the immoral and the so-called moral. And Jesus says, let, let, me, let me tell you why I'm doing 
what I'm doing. And don't you love Jesus? Whenever we start to try to debate doctrine, whenever we try to come up with our theological conundrums, whenever we ask our big systematical theological questions, what does Jesus do? Jesus gives us stories. How cool is he? We bring the most complicated questions. He's like, let me tell you a story. (laughs) We're like, okay, you are God. You can do whatever you want. He goes, let me tell you a story. So he starts out by telling three stories. The first story that he tells is this story about this shepherd. You can read it there in Luke chapter 15. Once again, you're going to go back this week with homework to do, and you're going to read this. But Luke 15, he tells about the shepherd, and the shepherd has 100 sheep, okay? And out of these 100 sheep, one day this one sheep wanders away from the pack. He gets away. He leaves. He, he gets into isolation. It's amazing as you read the New Testament, what you'll find out is that Jesus, over and over again, he compares you and I to sheep. And I wish I could say that this was nice or a compliment, but it's really not. Sheep, by all accounts, are some of the dumbest animals on the planet. God bless sheep. I love them, but bah, that's all they can do, okay? They have, they have uh, the, the people will tell us that they have incredibly, like, awful, awful eyesight. That they're almost blind individuals. In fact, the one thing that sheep do have that's good is, is sheep have good hearing. I think it's important that Jesus compares us to sheep because I think he's always trying to remind us that it's not about what you see, it's about what you hear. Because faith doesn't come by what you see, faith comes by what you hear. Come on, somebody. By hearing the word of God. That's why it's, it's, like it's just practical, right? Like, why do you come on a Sunday morning? Yes, it's to see one another. Yes, it's to worship God corporately. But it's also to hear God's word proclaimed. Because as God's word goes out, there's something about it that it produces faith on the inside of us. I don't have to be here. I need to be here. I I need this as much as you need this. But the thing about sheep that's funny is that sheep are not only dumb, but they're also really stubborn. Isn't that a good combination right there? It's it's one thing to be dumb, but just don't be stubborn. It's another thing if you're dumb and stubborn. Like, for instance, like sheep, if they're left all alone in a pasture, they will eat all of the grass in that pasture until it's all gone. Then what scholars will tell us is that they will actually begin to eat each other's excrement until they die. (laughs) Jesus goes, do you know what you guys are like? You guys are like sheep. They're like, I'm not finding the compliment here, Jesus. Jesus, I think, is referring to the fact that many times our knee-jerk reaction, our proclivity is to leave the community. It's to leave the church. It's to leave the group. And it's to go out on our own. And somehow we think that there's something better for us beyond doing life together. So Jesus says, you want to know why I'm doing what I'm doing? You want to know why my ministry is all about going into the night? It's because it's like a 100 sheep. Yet one of those sheep wanders off. One of those sheep takes off by his own will, leaves the pack, goes out in search of whatever it is that he's looking for. Yet what the shepherd does, the good shepherd is what Jesus will say about himself later on in the book of John, but here in Luke 15, he says the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes out looking for the one. Why? It's because God is obsessed with lost stuff. And so are you, by the way. Have you ever noticed that you can have everything in your house in order, but one thing goes missing and you go berserk? I remember we were first starting Voo Church. It was in September of 2015. And at the time we were getting ready to start, we didn't know what we were doing. So I decided to call a 21-day liquid fast. I just felt like that was very pastoral. I felt like that was very spiritual. I thought we might as well start this thing with a fast. And so I was like day 18 into the fast. And I had never done a full liquid fast. And so I was like halfway emaciated, halfway dying. And... We're not legalistic here at Voo Church. Like if there's chunks in the soup, I'm eating the chunks, okay? (laughs) But I remember I was at this this cafe and I was studying, I was preparing and I I got so hungry. I was like so famished that like I was seeing mirages is what I felt and (laughs) a little dramatic, I know. But anyways, um, I I got up from the cafe, if you can believe this. I left left everything there at the cafe. I left my Bible, my computer, and I went home like to eat porridge. I was like Esau in the book of Genesis. (laughs) Bible jokes, if you don't get it, it's okay. Okay, so... I just totally, I forget my stuff. I go to bed that night. I wake up the next day and I'm like, where is my Bible and my computer? And so I start turning the house like upside down. I'm like, where is my stuff? 
And then like every husband, I don't know why we do this, like it has nothing to do with my wife, but somehow I bring my wife into it. <laughs> Where did you put it, you know? <laughs> this is Eve's fault, you know? <laughs> Second Bible joke of the day, okay. <laughs> While I'm like having this conversation with Don Shreed, the, the phone starts ringing and I, I, I pick up the phone and they say, hi, we're, we're looking for uh, Rich Wilkerson. I said, this is Rich Wilkerson, you know? And they said, Rich, uh, we found your Bible and computer. I said, there is a God out there. <laughs> and then I was, I, I was so like, this is, I'm a sheep. I was like, how did you know it was mine? <laughs> They're like, your name is on the Bible. <laughs> I was like, how did you know my number? Your phone number's on the inside. I was like, maybe not so miraculous. <laughs> When I found out that they had discovered my lost stuff, dude, it was the whip, the nay-nay. I was doing everything. Like, it, it, it caused for a, for a celebration. I started to celebrate. Why? Because when that which is lost is found and you value it and you care about it, you, your, your knee-jerk reaction is to celebrate. It's to be thankful. It's to be grateful. It's for, it's for joy to rise up. Watch what the Bible says in Luke chapter 15. The Bible says that the shepherd leaves the 99. This is crazy. I got all this. I know. He, we know. Like, 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 like God loves all of us here, but he actually cares so deeply about every chair that is empty right now that he says, you guys are good here for a moment. I got to get back outside of these doors and I got to go find every lost sheep in this city and I got to bring them back into the community. I got to bring them back into the fold. Watch what the Bible says that he finds his one lost sheep and when he finds the sheep, this is what's crazy to me. The Bible says that he calls all of his friends, all of his neighbors and says, let's throw a party. Like when I read this, this doesn't make any sense from an economic standpoint. Like one sheep is not worth the cost of the party that he threw. Like the party that he threw, he could have bought another sheep. But see, this is the scandalous, reckless love of God. That if you're looking for a transaction, that's not what a relationship is about. That's why all of our metaphors about deposits and withdrawals and looking at relationships like it's a banking metaphor will never work. The idea is, is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. For who? For whosoever. Even if I get one back, that was worth the life of Jesus. I'm taking the risk and I'm throwing a party in advance that somebody is going to fall into relationship with God. I want to see the lost found in my Miami. Come on, somebody. Give God a shout of praise in this place. I want us to be a church, man, that we celebrate in faith. We throw a party before the altar call. I got faith that today in this 10 a.m., somebody, and if it's just one, is worth it. Rich, I don't know if it's worth, man, just one. I mean, we got here at 545 in the morning and we, worked, we, did a, we did a women's event on Thursday and then we have, small, we have Voo Crew again this week. That seems like a lot of stuff. Who, how many are really getting saved? I don't know if it's one, it's worth it. Because we serve the God who left the 99 and went and found one, then threw a party that costs more than that one. Why? Because he's obsessed with lost stuff. I want to be a part of a church that's obsessed with finding lost things. Come on. Is there anybody out there? JDD, I take, make a little bit of noise today. And this shepherd, he comes and he brings this one lost sheep back to the fold. Jesus is saying, you, you want to know why I do what I do? It's because I'm obsessed with lost stuff. Yeah. And you'll never understand my mission if you yourself don't get obsessed with what, that which is missing. So Jesus is like, you know, I'm going to keep giving it to him. He goes, I want to I I teach you a little bit more. He says, okay, this is what it's like. Imagine a woman, and she has 10 coins. But out of those 10 coins, she loses one coin. <laughs> the scripture says this. The scripture says that what will she do? She will turn her house upside down in order to find that one lost coin. 
By the way, this was all of our responses. If you go and look at your bank account tomorrow and you see that somebody pulled out $500, you're gonna stop what you're doing and say, who the heck took my $500? <laughs> Some of you are gonna, are gonna tap into the old man, the, the old woman. You're gonna, you're, gonna go, you're gonna go BC before Christ and <laughs> stuff's gonna come out of you that's gonna scare us. Yet I think Jesus uses this metaphor because we all understand that money has value, but many times we put more value on our money than we do on people. And Jesus really isn't teaching about money right here. He's teaching about lost people. And he's saying, in the way that you care about your money so much, in the way that you have it all lined up and all measured and you know all the details about it, it should be that much more about every person on this earth. I think as a church, I want us to care more about souls than we do dollars. Money is a tool to see souls encounter Jesus. And this woman, when she loses one coin, she turns the whole house upside down. Why? Because the coin still has value. Oh, this is good for somebody. Just because the coin is lost doesn't mean that the coin has lost its value. How many know there's some people out there that are lost? Yet just because they're lost doesn't mean they don't have value. Some of you have walked in here today and you think your value is determined by what the world has said about you. That's why you gotta be in church. That's why you gotta go to Vu Crew this week and actually go, okay, I came on Sunday. I need to parlay this thing with a small group of people because I heard it on Sunday, but now I'm gonna find a small group of people this week so they can tell me the same thing. The world doesn't dictate your value. God's word dictates your value. So I, th I think an easy, easy metaphor is like up here, I, I, I have a, a dollar bill. I, I should have gotten a a higher amount because some of you, it will be, a, you're like, I'm worth more than a dollar. I know, I know, I know you are, but just follow the metaphor. <laughs> One million dollars. Um, <laughs> did you ever see Austin Powers? <laughs> I never did. Um, <laughs> but like, I, I have this dollar. It's like super simple, right? And if this was $100, maybe it would make a little bit more sense, but this dollar bill, like, th this dollar bill has been given its value by the nation that we live in. The, the government has put its seal on it, has stamped it, and has declared that is worth $1. Yeah. Now look, it doesn't really matter what I do to it. Crumple it up, put it on the ground, stomp on it a little bit, you ever find cash in your jeans because it went through the wash? <laughs> it, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where it goes. It doesn't matter how many hands it's passed through. It doesn't matter who's touched it. it. doesn't matter what people have said about it. It doesn't matter if you put some Sharpie marker on it. The dollar bill doesn't lose its value because the dollar bill, its value has been dictated by something outside of itself. Your life looks a lot like this dollar bill. It doesn't matter who's crumpled you up. It doesn't matter who's stomped on you. It doesn't matter how many hands you've been passed through. It doesn't matter where you've gone. Today, God says you are valuable. You are my child. You are my son. You are my daughter. And you have been stamped in the image of God. And therefore, your value cannot be taken away because of what this world has said about you. Come on, somebody. Make some noise if you know what I'm talking about today. Your value is not dictated by this world. Your value is dictated by the word of God. Yeah. Yet listen to me loud and clear. What good is it to be valuable yet unused? What good is it to have all this potential in you, to have all this God DNA up inside of you, to have promises over your life, to be formed in the image of God, yet be completely unused. 
See, I think Jesus tells the first story. Let me defend why I'm doing what I'm doing. Let me tell you why Voo Church does what it does. Let me tell you why Voo Church is dropping 20,000 eggs, spending the money. Let me tell you why Voo Church is in the places that it's in. Let me tell you why Voo Church celebrates some of the gray areas, some of the stuff that's hard to calculate, some of the stuff that's hard to put on a data spreadsheet, some of the qualitative data that's going. I don't know. Is this a win? It's a win. We're planting seeds. We're watering seeds. Let me tell you why. It's because we're obsessed with lost stuff. Why are we obsessed with lost stuff? Because lost stuff still has value. Yet what good is it to be valuable, yet unused? That's why I believe Jesus tells his third story. It's like, I just think, I always think practically. I think sometimes it's good for us to connect dots because you can hear stuff and be like, oh, it was good. But, but it's like step four today, growth track. Like that, that's that principle right there. What good is it to come in every Sunday morning, shout, take some notes, tweet some stuff out, yet never be a part of the mission? Never get on board with being used by God. Your faith journey will always limp if you don't step into an attitude of behaving and looking like Jesus as a servant yourself. Step four is all about making a difference. It's all about changing the world. It's the front door. And so the logical connection point is going, wow, I've met Jesus, I was lost, he found me, he's placed value on me, but what good is it to be found and what good is it to have value but to never be used? That's what the growth track's about. It's about helping you go through those stages so that you might be used by God. So Jesus, he tells this last story. And the last story he says, I wanna tell you a story about, about, about two sons. Many times in church, we've heard this story uh, defined as the story of the prodigal son, yet Jesus, he didn't call it the story of the prodigal son. That's what, that's what Christians have called it. Rather, he said, I want to tell you a story about two lost sons. Now, why is he doing that? Why is he taking time to share about two lost sons? At the start of Luke 15, we, we discover our answer. It's because he has two crowds of people in front of him. His message at the time was polarizing for people and it was dividing people into camps. And so he said, let me me level the playing field. I've got tax collectors on one hand and I've got Pharisees on the other. I wanna give you my defense and here's my defense. I'm obsessed with lost stuff. Lost stuff still has value, but what good is it to be valuable and be unused? The only way that you will ever be used is if you're in the hands of God. And when you're in the hands of God, that means that you're in relationship with God. So he looks at one crowd of people, I'm guessing looks at the tax collectors, and he looks at the immoral people of the day. He says, I wanna tell you a story about this younger brother. We'll call him the prodigal. And the prodigal goes to his dad and says, dad, I want my inheritance right now. Everything that you're gonna give to me in the future, I want it now because this is what prodigals do. We think short term. We think, let me get everything now. There's no patience. There's no delayed gratification. Like go through the things that God shares with us. What what is sin? Sin in so many ways is immediate gratification. So God would say things to this world like the gift of sex that belongs in the confines of marriage. But we would say, no, I want it now because I'm a prodigal. So let me squander that which you say is a gift that should be delayed based upon your proper plan and let me do it now. You can go through the list of thing after thing after thing. It's not our church. Our church, like, read into the text. Discover what's taking place. Tax collectors were stealing money. They were greedy. They were stealing money from their own people, lying in their pockets. You heard about it in week one. And Jesus is like, yo, you're the prodigal. Like, you're not waiting. You're not patient. You're not following the plan. You're just, you're getting rich quick. You're feeding your belly now. Like, like what's drunkenness? Come on. Drunkenness is immediate gratification. There's people that go all week long and what's drug addiction? I got to feel something right now. And so he speaks to the prodigal and he says, this prodigal takes his father's inheritance, squanders it on everything. 
finally after he's ran out of everything. That's what it always does. Like you either, this is, we learn from two ways, rock bottom or revelation. <laughs> I've learned from both. I like learning from revelation. It <laughs> doesn't hurt as bad. But if I'm being honest with you, I've had to learn a lot of tough lessons at rock bottom. When I squandered every good gift, every good thing, I just, I ran it out to dry. I just quenched it. I just squeezed it out. I got everything I could get short term. Prodigal finds himself in a pig's pen. You heard me talk about it on week one a little bit, looking at pig's food, going, y'all, I'm going to eat pig's food? The Bible says that he comes to his senses and says, I should, I should go back home to my dad. The servants in my dad's house are living better than this. So he gets up and he starts walking towards his dad. And there the dad is representing God the Father. Jesus is saying, and the father sees him in the distance and the Bible says the father runs towards the son. The son's like walking slow with his head down, but the father's sprinting and running and it's like this beautiful picture that there's not all these steps you have to do. There's not like all this like confessions you have to make. There's not like all this, like, let me rid myself of this. Like, let me, it's literally just turning towards God, recognizing I have been squandering everything you've given me. I've been feeding my flesh. Anything that felt good, I did it. Short term gratification. I don't know, you go into your life and you discover where those categories. I've learned that as life goes on, those categories, they change. Yet the father, it's like he's just waiting for that turn and he wraps his arm around his son. And the Bible says that before the boy can even get his words out, the father's like, yo, put new sandals on his feet. Put a robe on his back. Put my ring on his finger. The robe and the ring and the sandals, they represent so many things, but primarily what it represents is it represents that you are my son, you are my heir. You see, you're not a son by worth, you're a son by birth. That, that's why you have to be born again. This language is not like just language that happens on accident, it's on purpose. I, I have been born again, I've been grafted into the family. I am co-heirs with Jesus. Everything Jesus gets, I now get because of the price that he paid. I'm no longer seen for all of my squandering and for all of my shortcomings. I am now seen as a son of God. I've got a robe on my back, sandals on my feet. I've got the ring on my finger. Bible says, kill the fattened calf for him. And what does he say? Let's throw a party. Lost sheep, they throw a party. Lost coin, they throw a party. Lost son, they throw a party. Is anybody seeing any connection point here? I think God is into parties. We call them parties with a purpose. The gray area is sacred versus secular. <laughs> Which one am I in? Just give me a second, boys. They're doing so good. Just you can keep playing keys, but just before you give me the George of the Jungle beat. <laughs> Rich, you don't have to tear people down to make a point. They're doing a great job. I, I think our life is actually supposed to be a little bit more married together. I don't want our church to be seen as this place that's so, is, is this church more sacred than your home? We got a problem. If the courtyard is meant to be more sacred than your car, we have a problem. If there's something happening in the courtyard that you don't like, it better not be happening in your car too. Stuff that people say at times is like perplexing. How do you know the songs on the radio if you don't listen to the radio? Well, I, sometimes on, on, on Fridays I listen to the radio. <laughs> what if we're called to bring the sacred and the secular together? And what if we're called to say, all right, we've been redeemed and we carry the robe and we're, 
walk in the sandals and we've got a ring and it was never about what we could do. It was always about recognizing that we were lost and utterly sinful without him. And so he saved us because here we go. He says he throws a party. And here's my text that I read. I'm already out of time. Then the Bible says, meanwhile, everyone say meanwhile. meanwhile. JDD say meanwhile. <laughs> but meanwhile, the older brother, look what it says. It says that he heard the dancing. That's always made me laugh. How hard were they dancing? <laughs> Y'all think I hear dancing. <laughs> like, like what are they stomping the yard? Like, that's intense. Scripture says he gets so angry and he refuses to go into the party. What does Jesus do? Jesus now shifts from one crowd of people, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, and now he shifts to this other group of people. He goes from the secular to now the so-called sacred. He goes from the prodigal to the Pharisees. He goes from the self-destructive to the self-righteous. He goes from license to sin to legalism of the heart. The Bible says that meanwhile, the older brother is out in the front yard throwing a pity party, angry. And notice what he's doing. He starts talking to a servant. Notice that a critical spirit will never go to the father with their problem. They will always find servants to talk about the problem. Like in a church world, like, what that looks like is that looks like afterwards, after a day, instead of actually bringing problems and issues and questions to people who can actually answer it, you take it to other people that are in the pity party with you. So the brother, he goes and he finds a servant and says, I can't believe my father would do such a thing. I've been here all these years. He's never even given me a young goat. Watch this. Relationship will always assume and expect the best. Religion will always, always, always resort and be okay with a reduced reward. A goat? Homie, why do you want a young goat? Religion settles. I I've done enough for a goat. Why would you want a goat when you have a father who has a fattened calf? Why do you want a goat when you can have the ring and the robe and the sandals? Why do you want to go when you have a father who's waiting to celebrate you and waiting to throw a party for you? The Bible says that the father, he leaves the party. I want you to see this because this is, this is like the whole message. He leaves the party, goes out to the front yard and has a conversation with the older brother. Look, look at both pictures. For the prodigal, the father runs towards him. To the older brother, the father runs goes to him and has a conversation. What does it tell me? It tells me that we serve the God who's known as the friend of sinners. And I don't know what type of sinner you are, prodigal or Pharisee, but what I know is this, is that our God has grace for those who've committed the crime, and he also has grace for those who judge the crime. He's actually coming to you today for relationship. This God looked at both of these crowds of people and he offered both crowds of people relationship. He said, son, don't you understand your brother? We, we thought he was dead, but it turns out he's alive. We thought he was lost, but he's found. We had to celebrate. You've always been with me and everything I have is yours. Just ask me, son. What do you need? Just ask me, son. I'm not impressed by your deeds. I'm impressed when you want to spend time. I'm impressed when you want relationship. I'm impressed when you just want to be in my presence. I don't want to be a part of a community that ever gets to the point that we stand on the sidelines and we watch as people come home. And as we watch as people come home, we judge them and we criticize them and we make jokes about them. See, Voo Church is not a place that assumes the worst in people. Voo Church is a place that will always assume the best in people. While the world talks about your past at Voo Church, we're going to talk about your potential. We're going to talk about your future. We believe the lost can be found. You say, Rich, why are you sharing this with me? I'm sharing this with you because our church 
is a place for the broken to come home. And our church is a place for people to find a relationship with Jesus. Because whoever you are today, wherever you come from, that's why he came. For a personal relationship with you. He's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. This week, Easter week, what an opportunity to invite people from all walks of life to the greatest party happening. Let's invite people to the party where the lost are being found. Let's invite people to the party where the dead are being resurrected to life through Jesus Christ. Our mission is Jesus' mission. Our defense is Jesus' defense. Why do we do what we do? We do it so that we might see the lost found in Jesus. Come on, if you believe that, can you go ahead and give God a big, big shout of praise?